I give you a new commandment. That you love one another just as I have loved you. You should also love one another. When we think about that, and think about what's going on in our society, how people are being blamed, how race becomes such a dividing factor. I have to tell you the story that when I first came to Toronto, now I'm a small town boy, London, Ontario. Yes. <laughs> Moving to the big city. And I'm living downtown with friends, soon moving out here to Etobicoke, just in the next few days, next few weeks. But I was taking the subway. And at the Bloor Young Line, I was there one day, I was heading back, I live close to the, right now, close to the Young Dundas Square. So it was a hot, steamy July day, you know, you're down there on the subway platform at Bloor and Young. And we're all standing there, you know what it's like, the crowd's ready to get on as soon as the door is open, and all of a sudden in the crowd, there was this person shouting out, you go back to the country you came from. Now, it was just seconds before the doors would open for the railway car. And what did I do? Just like thousands of others, we got on the railway car. And I thought, here in Toronto, Toronto, Canada, here we are, one of the most peaceful countries in the world, and yet we still hear things like that. So that got me to thinking, we need to talk about racism, or anti-racism, as our guest speaker will talk to us about. So he'll talk about a lot of this. We don't give them much time to talk about. But I think it's important now because of the way it's dividing our society. Not only here in Canada, but we see it in other places around the world as well. That moment still resonates with me as I tell you that story. Because what did I do? I got on the subway car rather than finding out where the comment came from. Is that what I should have done? Or should I have stayed back? I mean, there's another subway along in four minutes. Why did I need to take that one? It's always that question of what we can do, how we can speak up as followers of Jesus. And so our guest today, Mr. Ren Ito, comes to us from our uh, Shining Waters Regional Council. He is the animator for social justice issues, and he talks uh, to various groups, not only about anti-racism, but other topics as well. That is his particular propensity. And the first thing I asked Ren to do is to explain what an animator does. I mean, I'm old school. I think an animator puts pen to paper and draws something. And it might be like that, Ren, but I'm going to have Ren come and explain that to you, and then get right into his topic for today. Uh, as as uh, Karen mentioned, my name is Ren Nito. I'm on staff with Shining Waters Regional Council, which some of you may remember as uh, Toronto Conference. It's the regional body that this uh, church and all the other churches in the GTA, uh, United Churches, are part of. So I'm on staff there uh, doing social justice animation. Um, we haven't really, I've been on this job for uh, two years, and we haven't quite figured out exactly what animation means. Sometimes it means putting pen to paper, sometimes it means a lot of this kind of uh, putting ideas down. Uh, but uh, for the most part, the way I see it, the way I understand it, is uh, that my job is to, uh, to encourage the, the movement of the spirit of justice in our church and in our region. Uh, and so, so that's the sense of animating uh, that I do my work with. So it involves a lot of reaching out to communities of faith and encouraging actions that are happening there, uh, connecting folks across the region, um, you know, representing the region in, in uh, different actions, like at the Climate Strike uh, rally uh, just a couple days ago, things like that. So 
in a nutshell, I don't know if that makes animation any clearer to any of you all, but, uh, but that's, that's basically what I do. Um, so, thank you again, Harry, for, for inviting me, and thank you folks for having me. I, I, uh, when, when, uh, when the topic was, was uh, broached, and I was trying to think about how to, or what to share and how, uh, I have to admit, I was a little nervous. I'm usually a little nervous. Uh, I'm a nervous speaker, as it is anyway, but specifically when it comes to talking about race and racism and racial justice, and specifically when it comes to talking about that in United Churches, um, I'm a little nervous. It's a bit, uh, it's, it's difficult, and part of the reason why it's difficult is because our denomination and our many communities of faith, and this community of faith, tend to be uh, not quite monoracial, but um, the majority of our congregants, our, our members in our region, are white. And so talking about race and racism and racial justice in that setting means talking about things in a particular way um, and from a particular perspective. I actually, I have a whole, um, you know, if anyone's interested, I can show you all these notes that I'm not going to refer to. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> Where I was, I was like, okay, but maybe I need to, you know, explain what race is, break it down, you know, get into all the theory of this, this kind of stuff. Um, I should tell you, outside of the work that I do with the region, I'm also a student. Uh, I'm studying race, basically, um, uh, full time at an annual college, and so um, I, uh, yeah, so I had all these ideas about how to, to explain things, and then, and then I was done, and I looked at it, and this is just like all these words, and it's so dense, and and I thought, this is not really going to help anyone. Um, and so what I wanted to do instead was uh, actually just to share some stories. Um, I want to do, ooh, not the Sorry. <laughs> um, what I want to do is, is tell you a little bit about the story of race in our tradition, in the Christian tradition. Um, it's, a, it's a long story, a long history. I'm just going to give you some snippets. Um, and I'm hoping that as I tell you that story, you'll, you'll start to see some of the contours of what race is, what racism is, how race has worked in our tradition, in our world, how it's shaped you know, the, the, the world, the space that we are in. Um, it's a, again, it's a long history, it's a complicated history, there's a lot in there. Um, my hope is that you'll pick up on something, um, something will speak to you, and give you something to reflect on and hopefully share in our discussion afterwards. So I'm going to start way back, maybe five, six hundred years, five hundred years, in the 15th century. So we're in Europe at this point, in uh, the Iberian Peninsula, what eventually becomes Spain and Portugal. Um, and here, there are Christian nations that have just reconquered, reconquered uh, the peninsula from uh, Muslim uh, nations that had been in the area for several hundred years. So they have reconquered this land, they've re-Christianized this land, and they're now dealing with this problem that they have, or this problem that they perceive. There are threats to Christendom. There's a threat on the other side, uh, which is the Muslim nations uh, that still surround them. There's a threat on the inside, uh, which is the remaining Muslims and also the Jews of Europe who live among them. This threat is a religious threat, in a sense. It's a, it's a threat to religious identity. It's a threat to the Christian identity of that area and of Europe more broadly. And as these nations, as these European nations are starting to, to understand themselves and their identity in those terms, in Christian terms, that threat becomes a threat to the state, a threat to the people. And so it becomes necessary to identify and do something about that threat. And this is actually where we see one of the earliest expressions of race articulated in law, in public discourse. <coughs> uh, and it comes in the form of law. And that law, the gist of it is something that some of you folks might actually be familiar with. It's an idea called the blood quantum. So it's this idea that uh, you're, you're, uh, you, have a, 
you have an identity that is based on heredity, it's based on who you're descended from. So Christians in the Iberian Peninsula uh, start to try to identify Jews among them. And they say, if you are a Jew, you know, if you're a practicing Jew, you are a Jew. If your parents are Jews, if your grandparents are Jews, you are by descent a Jew. And that becomes grounds for uh, pogroms, discrimination, uh, seizing of property, all sorts of different practices that then take back that land and, and uh, those resources for European Christians. And so at the very beginning of race, what we actually have isn't just, it's, it's not sort of just this idea of, you know, we often, we often think about race as, you know, how you look, you know, um, like the color of your skin. Uh, and race actually starts um, somewhere sort of much deeper in a sense, and, and especially for us as Christians in a much more sensitive place. So it's starting with religious difference. This is starting to sound like a lecture. I really don't want this to sound like a lecture, so I'm going to try to like, cut some of the details and, and hopefully leave some time for us to, to discuss. So we're going to skip ahead now to the 16th century. So now in the 16th century, we have European Christians. And now they're getting on boats and they're sailing across the Atlantic, and they discover the new world. Um, obviously, there are people on this land uh, prior to the arrival of European Christians, uh, but European Christians developed this idea, this theological idea. It's called the Doctrine of Discovery, and it says that lands that Christian nations and Christian people uh, come across that aren't inhabited by Christians are free for Christian take. And the rationale is that the people who are on those lands and who are not Christian, so are not settling those lands, civilizing those lands in the same ways that Christian societies do, those people are effectively not people. They're savages, they're animals. And so with that, over the following centuries, land is taken by Christians, by Christian nations, Christian settlers, colonizers. So now we skip ahead another century to the 17th century. There's all this land, uh, there are all these resources, um, and someone needs to work the land. And so European Christians head on down to Africa. And in Africa, there is, um, a, there is a slave trade that exists there, has existed there for, for some centuries. And that's a result of a war that's happened between nations in Africa, and this is sort of a practice that has been ongoing. But when people arrive from Europe, uh, they enter into that context from outside, and what they bring with them is this idea not just of you know, slavery being an own thing to do, but slavery being something that's connected to race. So now we have European Christians coming in and seeing black Africans, and those black Africans are a property. So they are bought, and they're brought over, and they become the sort of the tools of, of colonization. They work the land, they work the, the fields in the south, especially in the plantations, and also in the Caribbean, across the Americas. Um, and they are their property. They're not human beings, fully, in, under the law or uh, in the Christian understanding. Skipping ahead again, another century to the 18th century. We're now in Asia, uh, where growing empires uh, across the world, uh, Christian empires, are now coming into this new market that they see. And they're there to take resources, to plunder. They're there to, uh, to in some cases, sell. In some cases, uh, bring resources back, drop resources off, like opium in China. And as they're doing this, they're developing this understanding of this other part of the world, Asia, as, as the other, as the difference, as what defines us, because we know what they are, we know that we are not them. And so Asia becomes this foil for Christian Europe, for Christian North America now, uh, for the colonizing Christian empires of the world. This is still something. <laughs> 
19th century. We're back here, North America. Uh, European Christians have been on this continent for some time. Black slaves have been here for some time. Asian migrants are starting to arrive here. And Christians, white Christians turn to look at the indigenous people who were on the land since time immemorial. And they wonder why they're struggling to survive in this new emerging colony that's supposed to be bustling, you know, it's the new world, it's full of opportunity. Why aren't these people coming along? What they decide is that it's their lack of Christian civility, civilization, lack of Christian values. They're still hanging on to their indigenous ways, spiritual traditions, uh, community, um, all of those things. And so they open residential schools to literally, in, in the words of, um, of the architect of this whole system of residential schools, to kill the Indian in the child. And the idea of hope is that what emerges out of that is a civilized Christian man who's ready to integrate into society. We have two more jumps. The next one takes us into the 20th century. And this one's a short one. It's the birth of our denomination, the United Church of Canada. 1924, 24, 25, 24. 25. 25, sorry. <laughs> And so the United Church is born. It is born out of the coming together of different denominations, different communities of faith. And it's born in a nation that has just barred Asian immigration, is systemically destroying the indigenous communities, and refuses poor people, including people of color, the right to vote and participate in society. This is the context out of which our church arises. And now we skip ahead to today, to 2019, where when Canadian leaders are building pipelines, American leaders are building walls, people support anti-racism, inclusion, diversity, um, all the right terms, but they berate uh, the Black Lives Matter movement for holding up the Pride Parade in Toronto a few years ago. They, there is widespread awareness of uh, the histories of uh, injustice uh, towards indigenous communities and people, uh, but the greater Toronto area is surrounded by oil water advisories and all sorts of First Nations. Muslims are harassed at borders. Undocumented migrants, mostly migrants of color, struggle to survive. And after almost 100 years, this church, our United Church of Canada, is still overwhelmingly white. So now one more, one last jump. We're going to jump all the way back to uh, 33 AD or thereabouts. We're not actually entirely. 100% sure about this was. We're on the fringe of an empire in Palestine where a dark skinned man belonging to a colonized people is climbing up the steps to the site of his execution at the hands of empire. As he's climbing up, he's thinking about his life, he's thinking about his death. And he's also thinking about what's to come. He has promised new life for the world, the good news that we aren't alone in our struggle against oppression and evil. He's promised us that God is with us. As he climbs those steps, I wonder if he's imagining where we're at now. I wonder if he's foreseen what will become of his people, of his church. I wonder if this is what he imagined when he gave his body, one body, to the church for the world. I wonder. I wonder what Paul's words mean now, that there's no difference between Jew and Greek. I wonder what that means for us 
living in a world where there's very much a difference. I wonder what that means for us, members of a United Church of the United Church of Canada, a church that is committed to being anti-racist and intercultural, and that is this reality that we're in today. <coughs>